Welcome to day two of the A4S Summit. And today we're deep diving into three of the really critical sustainability issues, nature, people, and climate. And to get us going for today's session, I'm really pleased to be welcoming Nigel Topping. He's just stepped down as U UN climate change high level champion, COP26, and brings a wealth of experience in terms of leading um, change to combat the climate crisis. Nigel, welcome. It's really fantastic to, to have you here. Hi, um, Jessica. Lovely, lovely to be with you. Fresh, fresh out of your role and, and um, COP27. So you've been climate change champion for, for a few years now, I think, what, three years? Yeah. Um, can you, there's obviously a huge amount of change that has happened over that three-year period. Um, can you share some of your reflections, some of the key achievements um, that you've yeah. I mean, I think number one would be that we really normalized net zero in the 2040s as the as the target. I mean, a massive mobilization of you know, the race to zero campaign, which we ran of uh, private finance uh, in all its varieties, um, private business, cities, states and regions, and that encouraging more ambition from national governments. And, and I think that's actually gone faster than we thought. And now what we see is real clarity of pathways to zero in every sector of the economy and so much more of a focus on short-term actions and very clear deployment goals in by 2030. I think also we've seen um, adaptation and resilience really being taken much more seriously now and um, and perhaps finally uh, we're really starting to properly, I think we're starting to properly um, see the kind of innovational, innovative collaboration between public and private in terms of mobilizing finance, particularly in emerging markets. I'm thinking specifically, I think you, with COP26, you you really saw that, as you say, that push to net zero, a lot of actors across the public, clearly governments making net zero commitments, um, private sector making commitments, finance making commitments to net zero, a huge amount of, of capital and organisations really setting those common goals. And that's that's the really fundamental first step. As you highlight on adaptation, the numbers in terms of emissions are still going in, in the wrong direction. And now there is, certainly we're finding, everyone is now grappling with how to translate a commitment to net zero into action. And I think you saw some of that coming through in COP26, so much uh, it, it, certainly reflecting on it and, and, and the, the mood music felt like it was a lot edgier a lot more difficult in terms of some of the negotiations and almost that high of making a big commitment. Now it's about the hard graph to deliver. Um, you were obviously there at the heart of heart of the discussion. So what would your takeaways from COP27 be? What, what's the positive emerging from it? Well, I mean, obviously the, the really big positive geopolitically is that is this political commitment to a loss and damage fund, which has been a real polarizing topic for many, many years between the most vulnerable countries who've done the least to cause climate change on the most effective and then the the, the the rich countries who've caused the problem um so that's a political breakthrough but it's a kind of empty vessel at the moment it's like we th there's an agreement but this, nevertheless that's a really important political breakthrough I, th I i think what's what's not talked about enough actually is because everyone kind of obsesses about the negotiations right and a lot of the action and all the real economy action is outside of the negotiations it's national government policies and it's and it's private sector and subnational governments sometimes i mean some subnational governments like california or the or the city of london are much bigger than many nation states in the process and there i think that sort of nitty-gritty work of converting big targets into very specific um actions is really leaping forward and i think if you look if you look under the headlines you start to see Real, I mean, just in just a couple of days ago, IEA's latest report on renewables showing that we'll have as much renewables deployed in the next five years as in the last 20 years. And, and so what we've seen is this whole breakthrough agenda, which we launched sort of state and non-state in Glasgow, really picking up. So steel, shipping, cement, you know, automotive, light and heavy, each sector starts to get very clear about what needs to happen. And there, the more that people converge around, we need 150 odd green steel plants by 2030 the more that starts everyone starts to de-risk each other um, and that's really exciting and that's what i think drives the kind of exponential change that, we, that we've already seen on renewables and evs and we're now starting to see in other sectors 
and then on the on the flip side what what things from the negotiations or the, or or indeed the the discussions that you've been at the heart of with the private sector um give you cause for concern what Two things. One, one which I think will just get blasted away by the overall momentum. But, I mean, there, it's still kind of frustrating that there are some countries still kind of lowballing on ambition, um, um, and they tend to be those with a big hydrocarbon sales interest. That's so perhaps understandable, but I think they're, they're just they're just going to be swept away. It's a kind of king canute play at this point. I mean, I remember a few years ago talking. I remember a series of conversations with big players in the steel industry, and maybe four years ago. They were they were like most heavy emitters in the kind of let's slow things down um, camp, and then they started to realise this is definitely going to happen. They were in the kind of we let let's manage the transition ourselves from the sort of supply side, and then after a year they're like oh shit the markets don't do that you know and it's the demand side that's going to drive it. So when you start having car companies and white goods companies and building companies committing to net zero twenty forty or twenty fifty, which means they've got to buy green steel. That's what's driving that sort of exponential pickup. Right, so 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 I'm a bit worried about it's, it's frustrating that the the Saudis and the Russians are kind of still sort of being an anchor on collective ambition, but I think that's going to get lost. But the bigger issue is just finance, right? So we need, and that's why we we commissioned me and Mahmoud, the Egyptian champion, and the both two presidencies, a, a really important report, I think, from Nick Stern and Vera Songway and an eminent group, basically laying out, taking what I call or take an engineering approach and not saying, can we get the 100 billion to be 120, but saying, what do we actually need to solve the problem? So let's let's work back from what is needed to solve the problem and then where the source of finance. That's a much more holistic view, which looks at domestic finance mobilization in emerging markets, reforms to multilateral finance, much more of a focus on leverage to get the very big levels of private finance. And it also looks at some of the real sticky issues around debt that need to be tackled. So that that's the area of biggest concern. But I think we made a step forward in the COP process, not just talking about what countries can negotiate within the UN climate framework, but having a bigger conversation about what else needs to happen. So that was a concern, but um, cautiously optimistic that that conversation at least opening up to be a bit more pragmatic now. And I guess to that end, there was a lot of um, finance has definitely really stepped to the fore over the last few years, as you as you highlight the, the um, official funding, which has always been a, a tiny fraction of what's needed. Um, has been hard to reach, but on, on the private sector, you've really seen that shift. Um, one of the things there's been quite a lot of focus in the headlines, um, and we'll be speaking to to Mary tomorrow as uh, from a from a G fans perspective as well. Is is that whole discussion between um, UN race to zero, G fans, whether or not some of the commitments are, are real? Do you want to just share? Um, the inside track on that, how real yeah, is, yeah. is it? Is it a falling away of commitment from from your no. perspective? No, I mean obviously, you know, Mark and I launched um, G Fans in April 2021, so it's still very young, right? And we had 160 financial institutions there and 450 by Glasgow, and now 550. So the first thing it says it continues to grow. Of course, a couple have dropped out. I mean, it's quite onerous, the commitment and a couple of the smaller asset managers have decided that, 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 that they can't cope with it at the moment. But I mean, that's huge growth and, you know, growing from 130 trillion to 150 trillion in a year when when markets have declined a lot. Right. So huge growth. That's the first thing to say. Second thing is um, hardly any of those companies in Glasgow had robust science based targets because there was it was like a commit to, you know, you join one of the, actually you don't join the companies don't join defense. They join one of the sectoral um net zero alliances and net zero banking, net zero asset managers, net zero um, asset owners, all, all of which have created sort of sector specific criteria in line with and confirmed to be in line with by, by race to zero. So that's really important. And that was something we decided as a founding principle that all those coalitions would have to be aligned with race to zero. Now, over 300 of those 550 have got publicly expressed science-based targets for sexual decarbonization. So take an example in the banking world, on average, those banks, major global investment banks, are committing to reducing their financed emissions in power by over 60% and in oil and gas by over 30%. That's a, those, are, those are huge numbers, right? That's two thirds and one thirds of the market shifting from black to, 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 to green. And those are the biggest banks in the world, right? Um, the, the specifics about the, the, the race to zero, look, there's, there's, there's some very specific issues that in the kind of mad world of US antitrust Republican um, fishing expeditions. Right, I mean, it's a kind of a nonsense to accuse the banks of 
colluding right um because everything's voluntary like race zero is voluntary and that's zero um, banking lots is voluntary but we but you know it's a mad world in the states right now and mary knows that better than anyone having been a formula regulator right how weird it is out there um so what we what we just and you've seen this as well you know we when we when we have successful voluntary initiatives we've seen it with cdp we've seen it with science-based targets initiative you start off trying to get everyone to use one initiative and as you move towards a more of a regulatory type mindset you tend to say you must disclose on a reputable platform such as cdp or you must set a a, a robust science aligned target using a methodology such as science-based targets so we've just decoupled slightly to uh, but to, to remove the specific requirement that the initiatives have to be race to zero aligned but the fact is they all are race to zero aligned right so we're just focusing on implementation at the moment but it was just to get away from that one-to-one -one relationship which is actually quite a familiar move that we you know you and i've seen over the years in other in other areas yeah no absolutely and 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 around you touching there on science-based targets and net zero one of the other themes that was definitely getting a lot of focus during cop 27 was um you know the the, the fact that the the science suggests how hard slash impossible keeping within 1.5 degrees is going to be um, something that you know when you looked at the models there was always most of them had overshoot um, or significant negative emissions over the second half of the, the century um, a lot of the the focus is is sort of net zero by 2050 but that doesn't necessarily give you keep keep you within some of those those temperature boundaries what what are the implications? Is there an implication? You know, do you think do, do you see businesses sort of doubling down on their commitments to with the realization that the, the physical impacts are only going to get worse the, the further above that limit? And, and I, I people talk of it as a target. I think that the target is keeping below it and it's really important to, to yeah. keep in mind not not hitting it. So there's a few things to unpack there. I mean, first of all, it I mean there is it is absolutely not impossible to stay below 1.5 degrees so that's just that's just factually and scientifically incorrect but also morally irresponsible to, to say that i know people are saying that oh 1.5 is gone um it's not gone until it's gone right um second and second thing to say is of course the as you said the scientists are really trying to trying to get us to understand that 1.5 should be treated as a limit not a target so, of course, if we don't hit 1.5, 1.6 is better than 1.7 is better than 1.8. But the but the science tells us very clearly that once we go past 1.5, we get into very scary tipping point territory where it's not a linear relationship between how much we break the carbon budget, but we we hit kind of exponential runaway problems like the dieback of the Amazon or the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. So um, we should be treating 1.5 as a limit, not as a target. So, so what's the language that we're using and we mean business and others? I've been using. Um, I, I think so. I think it's very dangerous. So I think people who are saying, "Oh, I think people are trying to be clever by saying, oh, it's too late." Like, like, like we told you so. Like, I'm like, really? What are you actually? What What is your intention in making that statement? Oh, it's oh, we've blown it, so we should stop trying. I mean, it's ridiculous um, because all of the e economic evidence shows us that the economic damage, and of course that's related to human damage, is going to be very big. So and we, and of course it gets worse the, the, if we break the carbon budget. So what I'm actually seeing is a kind of increasing kind of rational squeeze between that very real awareness of how bad things already are and are going to get worse, and a growing confidence actually that we know what to do and can do it faster. And I, and I don't think that growing confidence is getting enough press because press do doom and gloom, right? They do if it bleeds it leads. They don't do oh actually we know how to do this. So if you take if you take if you look at some of the evidence in the in the, in the latest IEA um, uh, World Energy Outlook, they look at their net zero scenario and they say, what do we need to do by 2030 in terms of manufacturing capacity for solar panels, um, batteries, uh, electrolyzers to make green hydrogen, heat pumps, so four technologies. And then they say, what was the install capacity in 2021? Uh, and, it, and it's like, it looks really bad, right? It's like, oh God, it's only like 25% for solar and 15% for batteries and 5% for electrolyzers of the capacity we need to be on track by 2030. But then they add on to that, what's the announced commitments to build new capacity? And already in 2022, 
with existing and announced commitments, we're at 100% of the solar requirement, something like 85% of batteries and 60, 70% of, of, of electrolyzers. And that's in 2022. It doesn't take eight years to build those factories. So, of course, we need to be at 100% of installed capacity by 2030, therefore 100% of committed and, and FID by 2026, 2027. But that's a much more positive view than all the reports which just add up current policy commitments or current NDCs. But of course, current policy commitments and current NDCs are a very bad indicator of the future because we continue to make policy and update NDC. So that installed and committed capacity is a much better and much more positive indicator. And just, just connecting that to, to some of the financing earlier earlier today with one of the sessions we were talking to the mayor of Freetown and, and Sierra Leone and, and you know who is um, an incredible um, advocate and really looking at some of the, the actions that are needed to, to achieve progress both on climate change and, and in terms of sustainable cities more broadly. I was talking about some of the real challenges, some of the real nuts and bolts of, of which, which many cities face in many parts of the world and, and those cities in, in emerging and developing countries are going to be critical to whether or not we, we can stay within the 1.5 degree limit. Um, are there some insights or some, some, some things that you're seeing coming from the finance? And, and one thing she was talking about was, of course, finance and, and some of the challenges. Are there some specifics that you're seeing that you think will unlock financing for some of the cities that really need it and, and the transfer of knowledge and technology and, um, and a different development trajectory that is going to be critical? Yeah, I mean... It's not an emerging market problem. If you just talk to the mayors in the UK, they'll all tell you they don't have enough powers to get on with doing what, what they want to do. So I think, I mean, there's very clear evidence that um, cities need to be given more powers to be a much more of a collaborator with federal governments to drive action. So, um, you know, the Coalition for Urban Transitions um, work, which is housed at WRI, partnered with C40, did a lot of work on demonstrating that um, a lot of the policy levers are at city level, but if they don't come with the finance levers, then they can't be unlocked. So, so there's a big, there's a real need for more countries to have like urban strategies within their NDCs. I think there are a couple of things that are really hopeful, though. One is we're seeing some quite good practice on collective procurement. Um, uh, you know, some very interesting work going on in Latin America right now with a, a, a large group of cities procuring electric buses. And you know you, you get a, you get a much better price um, and much better financing terms if um, if there's thirty cities buying a thousand buses than each of you buying thirty buses, right? Um, I, I think we're also getting better at the financing of infrastructure in terms of understanding that the the, the null case, uh, the do nothing case, isn't that everything stays the same, right? The null case is that everything gets worse. So it's it's a little bit of a a challenge for a lot of conventional ways of thinking about financing infrastructure is that actually you need to the counterfactual needs to be things get worse and that and that makes the business case much easier um and the things like the in the private finance world like the coalition for climate resilient infrastructure done a really good job of starting to unlock that with governments like jamaica and helping do a much more holistic view of what's the sort of best fiscal return um and looking at the fact that in resilient infrastructure gives a better fiscal return than non-resilient infrastructure which is kind of obvious but in most sort of modeling all you see is the increased cost of the resilient infrastructure and not the increased return and therefore you never do it right because yeah yeah absolutely and that's something that we um we're just kicking off one of our big programs is of course our cfo program and just kicking off a, a circle of practice with cfos from cities particularly to unpick some of those how do you you know the 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 real specifics of budgeting in the context of a city and how do you get the the numbers to add up and think differently think think more holistically um at the moment we've we've got um cop 15 by the biodiversity events biodiversity cop um you touch on resilience there there's clearly some very strong links between nature and climate both in terms of how um the the, the solutions and also um the risk of a negative spiral of um, of one impacting the other. So through through um, through the work that you've been doing, how do you see nature-based solutions playing a role 
in tackling the climate crisis? And is, is that an area that you're really seeing, um, you know, similar advances? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a bit like resilience generally and nature-based solutions seem to have lagged the more sort of technological energy and heavy industry in innovation cycles. And I don't really know why, but I mean, first thing is everyone knows there's no net zero without um, nature-based solutions without, or without getting to nature positive and it's quarter to a quarter of the problem, a third of the solution going on. Um, second of all, I mean, we the, the, the work that I've been doing and that was set and the, the way it was set, set up before I took on the role was very clear about you know the the that climate nature nexus whether on land in fresh water and, on, and oceans and coastal zones um and, and i think there are there are positive signs i mean like in africa there's there's some really good movement towards restoring degraded land like the 700 million hectares of degraded agricultural land in africa and there's now 32 countries committed to restoring 100 million of those and significant amounts of capital are starting to flow with some quite creative ways of unlocking public and private using sometimes carbon markets as a as a sort of as the sweetener to get over the hurdle right um i i think there's a lot more awareness now and hopefully we get a very strong signal out of um uh, out of cop 15 but this is again an area which needs innovation at the kind of public private multilateral finance um, so things like the Great Blue Wall Initiative in the Western Indian Ocean, so Eastern Africa, are really interesting. So multiple countries, but also some very big um, donor countries and private actors looking not just at the blue carbon economy, but looking at the overall economic benefits of restoring coastal ecosystems and in terms of creating jobs and, 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 and GDP growth. And I think that's one thing that Mahmoud Mahidin, my, my colleague, the Egyptian champion, has been very clear on is in emerging markets, we need to be much more holistic in our thinking and not just talk about climate benefits but lead with the sort of development benefits which are front of mind for ministers and mayors um, in emerging market uh, communities and of course not just for emerging markets but across across the board thinking of how people are at the heart of um, climate action both in terms of the impact that um, global heating is, is is having and will continue to worsen in terms of lives and livelihoods, but also, of course, thinking about the just transition. And if we can't get that right, it feels like we we won't be there. We won't be able to, to take the actions that are needed. And that's clearly one of the biggest barriers. Are you um, thinking of, of something like just transition and, and, and thinking about how people related outcomes, so so human well-being and, and lives, livelihoods yeah i mean all, uh, yeah well when we launched the race to zero which is very much about getting emissions down so it's kind of much much more of a technology lens um very very quickly had some friends like emma howard boyd you know who's, who's who run the environment agency or, or sheila patel who runs slum dwellers international you know who i'd met through the work on cities earlier saying you have to launch the race to resilience and gonzalo and i when i were a bit naive and we were like no 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 we'll just make the race to zero really resilient and of course, that's the, been the problem with resilience is everyone's tried to pretend, kid themselves that you can tackle resilience as whilst focusing on adaptation. So eventually we realized the folly of our thinking. And we launched, so when we launched the race to resilience, after a lot of thinking about it and consultation, we made that with lives and livelihoods absolutely central. So the overall objective of the race to resilience is to improve the resilience of 4 billion lives by 2030, because that's, that's order of magnitude the number of lives that are at, at risk of extreme events. So that's been a very different focus. So for example, one of my favorite moments in, in Sharm El Sheikh was we it was Sheila with Mary Robinson launched um, the Roof Over Our Heads campaign. And that's a really interesting, it's very much driven by Slum Dwellers International sort of grassroots, mostly women led organizations living in informal settlements in cities, but partnering with city governments and um, you know, engineering firms like Arup and construction material firms like um, like Holsim, um, because we still have a billion people who don't even have a decent roof over their head, and it's which is, and those are the most vulnerable to climate change for obvious reasons, because often those dwellings are in floodplains and they're they're most susceptible to flooding and to to high winds, and 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 the worst prepared for extreme heat. And how about? just transition and 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 the kind of actions that companies are or aren't or and, and and governments need to be taking for those who will lose their 
livelihoods as a result of a transition away from fossil fuels? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to think about that at multiple levels. And we've, we've I think most of the language around just transition has tended to focus on sort of supply side communities like coal and coal mine and, and coal fired power communities. Because there's often, a, I mean, there's a, for obvious reasons, there's a geographic um, dimension to, to that sector that's different from some other sectors. Um, but I think we are, need to be much broader in our thinking about just transitions and think about the demand side as well. So, you know, in terms of, for example, energy poverty or energy energy access, um, which is actually a much bigger problem. I mean, yeah, there's like 700 million people who don't have access to energy. And that's based on a very old developmental idea of energy access, which is like 100 kilowatt hours a year, which is basically a light bulb. Right. So, and that's I think it's it's rather a cute idea that oh, we give someone a solar panel, they have a light bulb, and the kids can they can do homework for an extra hour a day. The the work that Rockefeller and the GAP have done on on the new the modern energy minimum says we actually, we actually need more like a thousand kilowatt hours a year, seventy percent of which is for productive use. So thirty percent domestic, seventy percent productive, like solar powered agricultural pumps um, or solar powered cool cool chain for farmers to reduce um, and. At that metric, 3.6 billion people in the world don't have enough energy access. So I, I, I think we need to be much more, much broader and 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 more honest about the just transition. And it's not a few million coal miners that's the problem. It's 3.6 billion people um, and a few million coal miners that that, that is the challenge. So um, that that's what that's been the real power of race resilience, taking that human lens. Um, but I, I, again, it's a much bigger issue about and that's kind of down to my biggest concern is that uh, which is it's about the mobilization of finance in emerging markets because broadly speaking our biggest the biggest issue we've got is inequality and you can it's easy to see a kind of te gated tesla rati community net zero for the rich five percent of the world whereas where everybody else um has a kind of near net zero lifestyle that is very very bad in terms of all other human indicators yeah and so around, we, we, we're nearly out of time, but thinking of all of those different dimensions, so the race to resilience, race to zero, um, how access to energy and, and, and just transition is factored into um, actions as we head in towards next year and, and COP28. What would you like to see um, as a focus of action by business, by finance, by the accounting community over the coming year that you think will make the, the biggest difference? Um... I mean, I think I'm actually pretty confident on the race to zero. I think actually we'll get there way, way before 2050 because this sort of the shit storm coming down the pipe of economic and human damage is a very big motivation. It becomes more and more real every every day. And then the confidence that we know what to do and are doing it um, so on, on that side, I'd just like to see people getting very committed to short term action, that, which is relevant for their sector or the sectors that they're financing. And we now have quite a good framework, the breakthrough agenda, which the UK presidency led and partnered with. And it's been re reflected in the COP27 outcome. Um, and so and, and we've got actually the private sector is pretty well organized. You've got the Mission Possible partnerships so around steel, cement, shipping, aviation, etc. We've got clear pathways, clear metrics. So join into those. And, and and turn your net zero commitments into capex commitments for building manufacturing capacity or or or, um, or throughput capacity if you're an operator a port operator say um and then i think on the on the um on sort of resilience and development generally stop just catch bad thinking right so um zero sum thinking right the world's not a zero sum world there's a lot of very very negative um impacts from not investing we know that the overall economic story so look at look at that um if you're not if you're in finance and you have a very very if you have well just look at extending your footprint in emerging markets right? as a lot of money will be invested needs to be invested it needs to be invested well and so look look for markets that you're not active in now to look to start extending your footprint otherwise because that's where all the growth is going to be um and and so commit some resources to learning and, and leaning in. I, I'm seeing encouraging things. Some of the big banks now haven't historically done big deals in Africa, doing big investments in kind of African grid re, re, reinforcing. Um, so that bit for me, like really just double down on 
the race to zero because we can get there by 2040 in most sectors and we've already got people committed to that um and then really be careful to avoid non-zero sum avoid zero sum thinking and avoid the sort of the counterfactual myth that the world will be the same in 20 years as it is now if we do nothing so that you're factoring in that kind of negative real counterfactual of doing nothing rather than the null counterfactual yeah absolutely and and definitely the point there around you know every year clearly counts and counts more and more as we go um yeah. forward so really putting in place those short-term actions and i think that that I, i'd agree that that we really are seeing that starting to happen people don't have all of the answers but um but through a lot of the different the different groups that exist now a lot of the answers are starting to emerge at least to get you a huge amount closer yeah. and 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 you know focus on the 60 percent that you know and then think about the innovation um that is needed to close those gaps and every year you see that and and, and the other thing for me that really comes through is the excitement that you're starting to see of, of that innovation and the, the opportunities that exist shifting away from a, a thinking just about the risks the risks are key and, and important but the opportunity really drives um human ingenuity and that's going to be critical yeah and I, and I, I'm, that'd, be, that'd be where i would i would sort of end is like let's have more faith in ourselves I well, don't allow the press and the and the and the badly thought through reports which pretend that policy making innovation stops today to to overwhelm us and make us feel like we're all failures like we're amazing and if we put our mind to it we can do anything we can't do anything instantaneously and we're already too late so it's not like it's not a flippant response that oh we can just solve it but you know it, it the innovation that is unlocked when i mean i've seen this time and time again now you get serious companies say we'll go for net zero 2050 after two or three years of mobilizing their engineers and their finance experts, they're like, actually, we can do this in 2040. I've seen it with Mercedes, with Maersk, with Sony, with Aviva. I mean, more and more people are like, and it's very, very motivating for staff to feel like you're part of a problem solving machine that has real purpose. So I'd say have, overall, I'd say have more confidence to take on bolder targets. Um, it's very motivating. And then we, we keep surprising ourselves on how brilliant we are. Yeah, absolutely. And And what's not to love about you know, a, a cleaner, greener, um, greener world that, that we could have if we if we can get this right. Now, your final question for you, you've, you've just stepped down as high level champion. Um, so what what is your focus for the future? Where do you want to go next? I mean, I, really, the two things I've, I would just sum it up, I think net zero 2039. I, mean, I think there's very, very strong evidence that we're going way faster than all the doomster reports, which, you, which are very intellectually flawed. I can explain why I think that, but basically don't understand exponential maths or the way markets really work to drive this kind of transition. I think there's plenty of evidence that things are happening way faster than all those reports say. And we and, and we need to help people. I mean, RMI, Kings Mill Bond, RMI is doing some great work on that. Um, the IA are starting to do better work on that. But we need to tell that story much more and encourage, because it's a self-reinforcing loop, right? It's like when people think it's going faster, then they invest in going faster. And the second thing is how do we really innovate to mobilize the massive stock of private finance in emerging in emerging markets? Um, uh, those are the two sort of intellectual and political challenges I think we have to crack this decade. Net zero 2039 and 2.4 trillion for emerging markets ex China, which is the figure in the Stern Songwear report. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of those insights. And um, yeah, just just thanks, I think, from everyone for all of the, the amazing work that you've led. Um, right. Lovely. Thanks a lot, Jessica. Great to speak to you. Thanks a lot, Nigel. As you know, today we are exploring people, nature and climate. And I'm really pleased to be welcoming Maria Ferrara, CFO of Siemens Energy and a member of our CFO Leadership Network to delve into the people dimension of what it means to be a sustainable business. Um, Maria, really great to have you with us. Well, thank you, Jessica, and I'm really excited to be here. Hello, everyone. So let's just get straight stuck in. I, I haven't got long to cover, and there's so many different areas that I know you've been working on and, and, and leading on. So if we look at that people dimension of sustainability, it covers such a wide range of issues. So mm. all the way from things like diversity, equity, inclusion, living wages, um, human rights, to name just 
a few. What steps can organisations take to really understand the breadth of social and human capital impacts and dependencies that they have? I'd love to hear your perspective and, and maybe some of the tangible examples that you could share from the work that um, Siemens Energy has been doing. No, thanks, Jessica. And it's absolutely that wide range that needs to be covered. Um, and the way we uh, try to address it at Siemens Energy is to look at our sustainability program. And one of the important pillars of that program is responsible business practice. So it does cover all of those topics um, and forms the basis for our business. And I think it's important you know, that we look at topics uh, in that area regarding business and society. Um, and we did a materiality an analysis, so very tangible. And we started this in fiscal year 2020 and then repeated it uh, last year, where we look at having an ongoing dialogue with internal, but very importantly, also with external stakeholders, such as customers, investors, partners, etc. And that formed the basis for the fundamentals of our reporting. And this ranges from topics thinking about occupational health and safety measures to an unequivocal commitment to human rights. Um, and it also looks at choosing and managing our workforce um, from that perspective, and something that is near and dear to me, um, regarding inclusion and diversity and looking at that as a core strength. And the same goes for integrity and compliance. And this forms the basis and the foundation for all our decisions and actions. And we also see this as a task, not only for me or let's say fellow board members or the executive committee, but for everybody at Siemens Energy. And by the way, our employees do have a very strong voice there. And we try to look at putting in KPIs really to manage, track and measure our progress and provide an update in our annual sustainability report. Um, and as a global company, we also uh, fully uh, know and are aware of the social impact. I think this is what you touched on. And look at us, we're Siemens Energy. Um, looking at energy in the transition, it's going to have a massive impact on people, on societies and on employment, for example. So here's the people aspect. Um, for example, looking at retraining, and looking at other forms of support for in individuals that are impacted by that transition. Another aspect of this, and this to me is on equity and, and very important, is you know, we cannot leave large portions of the population behind or leave no country behind. Uh, and here, you know, we have to put people at the center and we have to take action and look at that social impact of new energy and climate strategies. Um, that coupled with, of course, again, looking internally at our own workforce um, and ensuring that they remain employable and to ensure that we have the right people going forward um, and looking at skills. This is ever adapting, right? Our skills. People talk a lot about digital skills, and we'll get to that later. Um, and learning. How do we ensure that people are on a continuous learning journey and offer a platform to do that? I know, uh, and again, it was a comprehensive answer, but it's a comprehensive point. Um, and there's various aspects that we try to address. And, and hopefully you saw that in our very newly issued sustainability report that's coming. So you touched on there one, one, one of the things that you, you mentioned around setting KPIs. And of course, um, that there's, a, there's a lot of support and, and input that um, both the CFO community and, and finance teams can um, provide in terms of that whole goal setting, um, but also, then the, the performance measuring and, and monitoring, as well as the, the reporting, and you, you touched on your reporting as well. Um, but of course, there's the information needs to drive decisions, not, not um, just disclosure. So how do you go about setting goals? You touched on quite a, a broad ranging set of issues. Um, how do you make sure that you, you set um, ambitious goals, goals that are aligned with um, societal expectations in this area. And um, clearly one, one of the things that we're seeing, not just in, in climate, where a lot of people are familiar with the idea of scope three, so the, the data along the full value chain, when it comes to some of the social and human capital dimensions of sustainability, similarly, understanding the impacts, the exposures that you have along your full value chain, whether customers or suppliers or, or others. And, and that's an area where you can really have some big um, big data caps and, and some, some challenges in, in gathering that data. Um, so I'd love to hear how you 
go about that goal setting and then also um, data gathering within Siemens Energy. Oh, thank you, Jessica. And that's a really comprehensive uh, question. And I think some of the goals we all have uh, the relative disclosure on scope one, two, and three. And uh, obviously we have our own goals within Siemens Energy that we're trying to uh, achieve. And you know we've made those very tangible. So things like neutrality within our own system uh, by 2030 um, and only green sources of energy by, um, by next year. So again, those are very tangible. The entire organization um, needs to be behind that. And you have to have concrete actions in place to really drive that especially for the, I shouldn't say especially because that feels exclusionary, doesn't it? But I think for large global organizations, you're at different start points within all of the various countries in which you operate and so on. So I think, um, you know, having those tangible measures and really tracking that um, is part of the, let's say, the ability to, to get success and to reach those goals. But you touched on something very important, which is data. Um, and, and I think we talk about this in A4S, and this is where I think, by the way, you're absolutely instrumental in how is that data captured globally? How do we then tackle the administrative aspects on that to you know, do the, that standardized reporting that we know is coming that we see with taxonomy um, and CSRD, et cetera? Um, but you know, going right to the core in terms of data. And for us at Siemens Energy, I think uh, you know, we wanted to ensure that it's good data that we're dealing with, clean data in our platform, because as you rightly mentioned, to make those decisions, you have to have concrete facts, facts in front of you. Um, and I think this is the good data in, hopefully good data and analysis out. Um, and then looking at people again, because who is managing that data? Who's entering that data? It's about people development. Um, and digital skills, as I mentioned earlier. And I think data scientists, data analysis, data interpretation, um, even looking at this as a core finance capability is something that I think is, is, has always been important but is continuing to grow in importance. Um, but also the personal skills, because all of this kind of intersects, doesn't it, um, with these intercultural skills, the ability to understand how that all comes to play. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we talk about is danger, data being very tangible, but it's not exactly neutral and it is backward looking, isn't it? So interpreting that data, um, I think is also a skill, uh, as I mentioned. And I think this is where my roles, uh, you know, intersect the CFO and the chief inclusion diversity piece, because when it comes to, to, to data, we need to ensure that it's, it is, uh, you know, with, without bias. Um, and this is difficult to be honest. Um, Looking at the data collection itself, going back to you know companies that have these global footprints, um, you know these are this is really tricky, and I think there's certain uh, situations, regulatory uh, challenges that we face in different parts of the world, um, and this creates challenges. I mean, and and like I said, this is where I know a us is really helping. You know, how do we ensure that um, you know when it looks at CSRD or GRI standards? that how, how we report that is, 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 is getting difficult. Um, but of course we need to follow all the rules and ensure that you know, each country that we're active in, that we respect the regulatory environment um, for sure. One thing that we're doing in terms of other types of data on uh, IND, so inclusion diversity, we're also looking at compiling this because as we've noticed, even with some of the climate related disclosures, it's not you press a button and the data comes out and you're able to see it. Sometimes it's, it's qualitative um, in nature. So you have to compile it from different sources. So what we did um, to, to understand our start point uh, with respect to IND is we're now embarking upon a global survey. Um, and this is the first time we're doing it. It's, it's a voluntary survey where data is collected completely anonymously. And we ask our employees to, to, to provide us with things like how many, you know, coming out at the office or about disabilities or, you know, what do, uh, let's say, minority groups need for their specific situation. So this is also another part of data that we're, we're trying to handle to understand, um, you know, how to navigate our company in these challenging times. But I'm hoping that with a different mindset, an open mindset, um, that people will continue to provide that data, that we'll be able to manage all that data, make better decisions and ensure that we have an equitable and open uh, workplace and people feel safe to, to provide it and to speak up. 
Picking up on um, on that example of diversity, equity and inclusion, as, as you alluded to, you're both CFO and Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer. Um, when it comes to some of the, the data in that area is, is just one of uh, the many different types of social impact um, that you have as an organisation. You touched on some of the steps to really develop that baseline and understand your, your starting point, which, of course, is a really important um, thing to get right first and, and to really build that understanding. When it comes to something like diversity, equity, inclusion, it's been in, in the press recently a lot. Um, not all of the countries um, that you will operate in have the same legal frameworks, the same sets of rights or, or views on um, social issues um so how do you how do you navigate some of those challenges and apply some of the global principles and approaches that you might adopt into different countries in which you operate and, and that's exactly the challenge right um of course how do you strike that balance we would ensure that we're always abiding by all of the regulatory aspects that we need to but at the same time, I uh, want to ensure that we're able to, let's say, display or be able to even encourage um, the, the workplace that we want as a company. And, and I think that's, that's difficult um, because we are a global company, we report globally, but at the same time are fully aware that in some countries where, for example, um, homosexuality is considered a crime, like how do you then handle that or even you know get data uh, like I said earlier in, in terms of how to ensure that our empl employees feel that they can and can and will thrive in our company and this is this is a balance uh, I, I wish I could say to you I absolutely know how to handle that but it really is a balance um, and we're trying to ensure that we're able to manage all of that complexity but at the same time abide by the regulatory because it is regulatory in some cases but at the same time, still trying to ensure that within our company, we're able to, like I said, have the environment we wish to have. Um, it's not easy. And I, I think it's a conflict that we all, all of our companies, large companies have to, to, to live with. But that's why we're doing this global IND survey. I think that's exactly the unlocking of the regulatory aspect, if you will, um, because it's voluntary. So people will provide that data. I mean, so it gets around, you know, um, and it's anonymous. So somebody will not be reprimanded and so on, but it allows us to collect that data to make better decisions and to allow ourselves to understand the situation in all parts of the company, which, which is complicated, as you rightly mentioned. It's a very difficult to navigate um, right now with all of the external and internal factors affecting us. And how do you find that the, um, that, that role and your role as CFO sort of in, intersect and... Um sort of may, may are there areas that the that by getting insights through the work that you do around inclusion and diversity sort of enhance your ability as a CFO and and vice versa uh, it's really it's it's great that you asked me that question because it's hot it's actually difficult to say okay right now I'm only going to be CFO the next time I'm going to be CIDO because you know and and I think you actually know this and feel this it's something that you're you're passionate about. It's something I've always been passionate about. Um, so therefore, I can't. It's I say it's two sides of the same coin all the time. And and I truly believe that it does drive better decisions. That it does financial performance is enhanced because it is driven by people. And if people feel that they're able to come to work, really bring their full self, um, be able to provide their different views, that that's not only tolerated, Jessica, but it's actually not only accepted, but embraced. And, and I think I really feel strongly about that. That's when you unlock the power of this, these diverse teams that we have. So I think it does benefit me. And, you know, I often get, you know, are you conflicted sometimes? Do you feel conflict? Um, and, and I say, I think I'm hopefully better equipped because I'm thankfully in a position to be able to make some decisions to ensure that it does benefit, you know, the same side of that coin, if you like, or the two sides of that same coin. Um, and it's also, I think, that my ability as CFO to ensure that I steer resource um, and, you know, uh, yeah, resource and money, frankly, to, to where they make the biggest impact. And I think that also includes our I, I and D initiatives. 
And I'm data driven. And as the CFO, you want to have KPIs. And I always say, you know, what gets measured gets managed. Um, and therefore the goals need to be realistic. They need to also be ambitious. Um, but we need to ensure that we continue to track our, our progress. So I think it does, it does affect um, positively both sides. And I, I really say that sometimes they think, oh, the CFO benefits the IND. Like, no, the IND side actually benefits uh, my decision-making and how I conduct myself as the chief financial officer as well. And you touched there around some of the different ways that finance um, can help to deliver some of the people related goals. So, so whether that's diversity, equity, and inclusion, or some of the work that you might be doing around human rights or, or labor rights, or you know, um, employability and jobs you touched on earlier and, and, and a just transition. So can you give some really tangible, just, just a couple of tangible examples of how finance can help to embed into strategic and operational decisions um, and, and some examples of, of areas that finance really can have that really big impact. Yeah, you know, I can just say, of course, finance has that very big impact. Um, and because at the end of the day, Jessica, I think there are no decisions that are made without there being some sort of financial impact. Um, and I think that's where, you know, being part of the process in terms of, for example, very tangible, looking at a particular investment and saying, not only looking at that from a return on the investment, but actually what is the impact on society? What kind of um, individuals do we need? Do we need um, reskilling? Do we need different, exactly different groups um, to be able to, to, to make that investment work. And, and I think this is exactly where certainly my company, but other companies are looking at this much more holistically um, or looking at our various scope, you know, scope impacts. Um, and, and I think putting that also into the investment card uh, or a process that's very tangible. At a minimum, it starts to ensure that people understand the impact of decisions. And I think sometimes we're so go, 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 we got to, you know, we have to do this and we have to go forward, that if you just stop and look at it from a, not only just a quantitative uh, perspective where finance is always involved, but also from a qualitative perspective and how that impacts um, the various other areas. And I think the impact on people, society and nature, I mean, I believe that that needs to be built into the decision-making process and that we have to um, not only for our internal stakeholders, but also our external stakeholders. I mean, this is also important. Um, and I think this needs to be measurable. I, I think that's where we come in. I think we, we show that the ESG strategy is thereby linked to our business strategy. It's linked to where we allocate resource. Um, and, and I think that's exactly where our impact is. Um, but also, you know, and this is what I talked about earlier is the non-financial aspect of KPIs, you know, I think this is also the high quality aspect is sometimes challenging, right? Because you're gathering potential input from different areas. It's not just a click of a button coming out of your, you know, your financial systems. Um, and I think to have the same quality in our non-financial KPIs, which are becoming more and more prominent, I think this is where finance comes in. We have to say, how, how do we establish these reliable processes and systems? And I think that discipline that we have um, the strengths and experience, uh, I, I think we have a leading role to drive the social agenda holistically forward. Justin, we're nearly out of time. So I think we've got time for just one final question. Um, something that A4S has done a lot of work through our A4S Academy, which um, the, the next cohort is just, just open, opening for, for applications now. And we're celebrating the graduation of, the, of, of last year's cohort. Um, what skills do finance teams need um, to really be able to have the kind of impact through their day job that you've been talking about today? Yeah, maybe I'll try to encapsulate into three, you know, digital skills. I, I talked about it a little earlier. I think, you know, this is a very broad when you think digital, but I think it goes back to the data in this data, financial or, you know, uh, qualitative and non uh, uh, quantitative and, and qualitative data. And I think that ability to have uh, the digital skills related to capturing that, but also being able to further improve efficiencies and so on, because at the end of the day, that's also part of it and, and something that I think finance is responsible for within the inner construct of the company. 
I think in terms of uh, real leadership skills, the ability to be uh, resilient. Uh, if we look back uh, over the last, let's say, year or so or a few years, I mean, this resiliency factor has been um, pivotal, I think, or absolutely a foundational element that we as leaders have had to have. Uh, and to be able to adapt quickly. And I think this is also something, the business cycles are becoming shorter. How we're looking at uh, forecasting, budgeting. I mean, how do we then take all of these factors that are sometimes volatile and uncertain um, and put that into to an ability to, to forecast for the future? I think we need to be really um, better equipped for that. So looking at adaptability and resilience, I think is, is, is key. And then this holistic thing, thinking not just thinking about uh, you know, the numbers in this part of my, my report, but really looking at it holistically, as I said earlier, when it comes to investment, when it comes to other um, key decisions, is keeping sustainability at the core and saying, okay, you know, holistically, even if from a pure impact, p &L impact perspective, it looks positive, but what are the other aspects um, you know, from a sustainability side? And I think we have to somehow marry those two a little more um, solidly within the finance skills of the future. Fantastic. Thank you, Maria. It's, I think we could probably delve into some of those points um, for, for a lot longer, but um, sadly we're out of time. So thank you so much for sharing some of the insights, some of the, I think, practical takeaways that people can, um, can think about and, and apply in their own organisations. Um, the final session for, for today is going to be um, focused on nature, and of course people are part of nature, so um, we'll look forward to hearing more about, um, about some of the actions in the nature area with our next speaker. But thank you very much, Maria. Thank uh, you, pleasure to have you with us. And thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. For this particular conversation, I'm here with Marcelo Bacci, who is the CFO of Susana, one of the members of our Brazilian circular practice. I'm really looking forward, Marcelo, to hearing some of your insights into the question of nature and, and some of the really practical examples that you might be able to share to help people think through why nature is so important and what they can do to help restore nature. I think we, we, we hear a lot about the climate crisis, but nature is also in a state of emergency. And if we don't respond, we, we really won't have a future. So looking forward to hearing your, your insights and, and top tips. Thank um, you very much. It has, been a, it has been a pleasure to be participating in the, the Brazilian Circle of Practice and uh, very pleased to be here uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with this public. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. So I think, first of all, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, what nature means to you and to Susano as an organization. Look, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, so first, I, I would like to start by saying that Susano is a company based on natural capital. And that, that means that uh, everything we produce comes from planted trees. Uh, and those planted trees, uh, they uh, are, of course, planted in a commercial scale, but they are uh, uh, natural trees. Uh, the only difference is that we plant them to harvest them. We don't use any, any native forests. Uh, but it's important that the company has 99 years old uh, at this point. Uh, and the fact that we've been here for so long, uh, we can only do that by treating nature on a proper manner. Uh, we plant and harvest trees in the same area we've been planting for decades. So if we don't do that on a responsible way, in a way that conserves the nature and conserves the characteristics of um, uh, what you know, is there uh, at our disposal, we would um, create an issue for the company in the long term. So uh, natural capital is very fundamental for our business to start with. Uh, and that makes uh, the second point, which is uh, we are, because of this characteristic, one of the few climate positive businesses that um, not, not only Susana, but the, uh, the pulp sector is one of the few climate positive businesses in the world in the sense that uh, by planting the trees that will be the raw material for the products that comes downstream, uh, we create more absorption of carbon 
and therefore we create a positive contribution to climate. Uh, Susano has become over years, you know, as I said, 99 years old. Uh, over the last five years, we have become uh, the largest in our sector worldwide. We have about 30% of global market share in hardwood pulp, uh, which means that we have a responsibility that comes with size and comes with uh, you know, the impact that we generate and that we can generate um, both in the way that we operate our business and also with the products that we'll bring to the market. Uh, because you know all the, the climate, ESG in general, nature, this is much more of an opportunity than a risk for us. And uh, the, bad, the better we deal with this, uh, the more we're going to grow. This is the belief that we have. So uh, we are in a very you know, unique position where uh, you know, all these uh, uh, the things that have become more, uh, you know, more and more being discussed by us as a society are all playing in favor of our business model, which under, I understand is not exactly the case of every company in the world. But uh, I understand that nature is important as a business opportunity, maybe be important as a, uh, as a compliance situation or issue. It's important for risk management, it's important because of corporate responsibility. It's important in many different ways for different companies in different, uh, 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 I would say, percentages. But um, you know, for us, it's more than everything corporate responsibility and also business opportunities. And, and you use words there like natural capital and nature. And as you say, as a, as a, um, a business that's very much founded to and close to nature, um, it's clear that, that you need to be thinking about how to set meaningful goals in this area, how to, how to set the right kind of targets and how to think about the different kind of impacts and dependencies that the organization has on nature. Can you um break down when you when you use a word like natural capital what kind of specific elements of nature um do you think about and are important to you as a business so whether it's you know water biodiversity some of the other um ecosystem services that you might need and benefit from um for your organization as well as impact and therefore need to be thinking of how do you protect and replenish sure uh, for our business to operate properly and uh, efficiently, we first need land. Uh, we need land to plant and we need to optimize the land. You know, the, the less land that we use, the better it is for us and for the society in general. That land has to have, uh, for, for the plantations, it has to have some characteristic, the comp composition of the soil, plus insulation and rain regime. So we depend a lot on that combination of factor the composition of the soil, the rain, the sun, the temp temperature that has an ideal range in which we can operate the altitude, uh, things like that, uh, that we need to be uh, relatively stable over time so that we can plant the best plums that we're gonna plant in different regions. Uh, after the, uh, the trees, the trees are harvested and they are sent to a plant. And the plant in our production process, we need uh, water. So uh, we, normally the plants are close to rivers. We give back to nature clean water in about 90-95% of the water that we capture, but we need running water for the process. So we understand that we have an impact on that. And uh, water is crucial for us, not only the rains in the forest, but also the rivers that we use as part of our production. Uh, I, coming back to the forestry side, we learned over time that having a mix between planted forests and native forests, of course, we're only gonna harvest the, the planted ones, but the, planting them in mosaics together with the, the native forests enhances the productivity. So biodiversity is important. So we have learned over time how to deal with that and how to you know, incorporate more uh, the reserves uh, within our, our farms. And again, making sure that the, the only plants that we harvest are the ones that are planted for commercial reasons. The, the, the reserves, they stay there, but it's important that they are intertwined with the rest to enhance uh, the, the yields uh, and also to guarantee that the, the water, which is underneath, 
is being uh, treated treated on a proper way. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, we need uh, the more we uh, the, the better we treat those elements, uh, the more results we're going to have. Uh, of course, we have some uh, other issues that we have to deal with. We, we have GHG emissions in the plants. We have GHG, and GHG emissions on the uh, transportation of wood to, to the mill. But we try to do everything in a way that the positive impacts are higher than the negative impacts. And the other element which is very important to us is the fact that over time, our industry has become more and more advanced technologically in the sense of creating a closed circle a closed circuit in the plant. So uh, we give back to the nature pretty much all the water that we capture. As I said, we are co-generators of electric energy, uh, which means that uh, our plants are self-sufficient and we generate the excedent uh, that we can sell to the grid. And that's a clean energy because it comes from the trees. Uh, so uh, we have all these elements that have to come together uh, for the business to, to work. So that's uh, more or less uh, the way that we, we think when that we, we try to optimize this um, natural capital more and more to be more efficient and also to reduce the negative impacts that we may cause and to potentialize the positive impacts as well. And so how do you go about setting um, goals in this area? So there's a lot of focus on setting science-based targets for climate. When it comes to nature, how do you how do you set science based nature positive goals, particularly um, the guidance is still evolving in this area? So what do you draw from as an organization to make sure the goals are credible? Yeah, we, we have decided a few years ago, three years ago, more or less, to, to establish some goals, some medium term goals, goals for 2030. Uh, in many different aspects, uh, including water consumption, GHG emissions, uh, uh, residuals, uh, and more social goals like uh, you know the, the impact we have on poverty and other things, uh, 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 more on the social side like inclusion, and diversity, and other things. But looking more into the the, the nature side, uh, we look a lot at the um, at the benchmarks. Who are the best companies in terms of usage of natural resources? Where we are in relation to those? what kind of investment and changes in our process we have to do in order to, to improve, and what's the time frame that we need, uh, what's the pace of the improvement that is feasible for us. And then, of course, we add a degree of, um, of a challenge to those things to, 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 to make them you know, as fast as possible. But you know, setting the targets is important, but more we have learned over the last three years that more important than the target that you can always, you know, calibrate if necessary is going in the in the right direction once you go in the right direction you can always improve the the speed afterwards but it's important to point the company in the right direction to make sure that this is important uh, for the company internally for everybody in the company so for instance things like establishing the goals related to nature as part of for instance uh, compensation it's as important as having the goals because if you have the goals, but people don't take them seriously, and you only, you know, the only thing that matters is production and sales, it, it really is not going to take you anywhere. So uh, the journey that we've been through is setting the goals, not worry too much about the, you know if they are precisely calibrated, pointing the company in the right direction, and work on the calibration over time to increase the speed. And I'm going to I'm going to give you one example. We have set a goal. Uh, three years ago, of um, uh, absorbing 40 million tons of carbon from the, from the nature up to 2030. And as we started to operate and measure that in a proper way, we found out that the goal was too light, it was too loose. And then we pushed the, the target year for 2025. So this is the kind of thing that we do. You know, it's important to, to, to do the right things and then we, we give ourselves room to calibrate all that. And you touched on, um, I think, one example there of using compensation and bedding into remuneration measures as a, as a way of really translating a goal into action. Are there some other um, examples you could share of how, particularly thinking of, of CFO and finance teams, what kind of things can they really do to 
um, drive goals around related to, to nature into decision making? Yeah, we have uh, two uh, examples that I think are very good here. Um, one is, of course, the sustainability linked bonds and loans that we have done over time. Uh, we have several transactions today. Suzanne is a company that has about $15 billion of debt. About 40% of our debt is sustainability linked. It's green bonds, SLBs, SLLs, things like that. Uh, especially the sustainability linked bonds that have become more popular in the last three years. We were the second company in the world to issue those kinds of instruments. And uh, some of them are linked to reduction in GHG emissions, some others linked to water consumption and also some others to diversity. And uh, uh, the effect that we saw first was to uh, reduce the cost of funding. Uh, we proved uh, that with that structure, we could tap a, a, a different pool of funds that were not available to us before. And by doing that, we, we, we were able to create the, what the market started to call the greenium, which is the premium uh, related to sustainability uh, measurements. Uh, and also it creates a side of two important side effects. One is reputation and the other is like the compensation, the mobilization of our teams. Because once you go to the market and say, look, you know, I have this target to reduce water consumption in the plants. And by the way, if I don't meet the target, uh, our bonds will have a step up of 25 basis points. The, the message that you send that creates reputation outside the company and creates commitment inside the company is that we are very serious about that. We are willing to pay a penalty if we don't do what, the, what we're saying we're gonna do. So uh, that's one example that worked very, very well in terms of both reducing our cost of capital and also creating uh, mobilization internally. And the other example, which is a, a work in progress is how we incorporate uh, different measures or different criteria for decision investment, for investment decisions. Uh, and we started to bring uh, the effects that the different investments that we do, mostly the industrial investments in modernization and other things, what, what is the effect in addition to the economic analysis uh, that those investments may have in our, uh, regarding our targets, the targets that we set and uh, give a specific weight for that in the decision uh, criteria. That's a work in progress, uh, something that we just started to do. Uh, we're still in the calibration phase of that, but it's important that we start to, you know, bring that, uh, that point also as an important point. Of course, we're not gonna do something that is completely inefficient from the economic point of view, but we cannot disregard uh, the, 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 the nature effects or the climate effects or any effect of that, of that nature in the investments decision. And just as a, as a final question, um, are there actions or is, is, there, is there one or two things that you need from the, the system as a whole or from others that are gonna help to really accelerate action around, um, around nature? And what, what would you really like to see um, evolve in the next year? That's a lot linked to what we do here in the circles of practice of A4S, which is uh, discussing the different points of view of different companies and trying to find first uh, uh, alternatives or opportunities of standardization, of reporting, of criteria, uh, because today uh, this uh, everything that is related to nature still has a lot of subjectivity uh, related to that. And, uh, you know, we are still finding the way to standardize how we measure things and what's a, what are the proper benchmarks for the different measurements and measurements that we create. So standardization is a work in progress, is something that we have to actively seek. And that's the reason why we are, uh, you know, this, we have decided to participate in this effort here. And the second uh, related to regulation, I think, you know, the governments, they have a role in that. But I fear that uh, we are going in the direction of having too much regulation and that the process becomes more important than the, um, than the outcome. Uh, I think you know, nature related issues, they cannot be treated as a compliance issue only. You have to look at the result that you're generating with that and not only checking boxes. So I fear that when regulators come, 
they tend to standardize the base and create obligations that will not guarantee that we're going in the right direction. So I think we have to have the adequate, the proper level of regulation, but not too much, uh, because otherwise the process will become more important uh, than actually what you're doing in the end of the day. So uh, I think this is important. It's uh, all new. Things that we're discussing here are relatively new when compared to other business issues that we've been having for, for a long period of time. So I think it's normal that we're st still trying to find uh, the best uh, standardization, the best uh, you know, regulation, uh, but we need to work in the direction of, of having things said more clearly and not to you know, exaggerate on the regulatory side. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot, Marcelo. I'm afraid we're out of time um, for this session, but really great to hear a little bit about some of the actions that um, Susano has been taking, um, some thoughts about how finance can really start to embed nature into the decision making processes. And that that point that you you finished where really focusing on the outcomes and, and for me, not waiting for others to um, drive the action, but taking the initiative and really looking at how you can accelerate progress. Um, with all of the guidance and um, and insight that is already out there. And, and as you highlighted, leverage the work of others and insights from others to just help you get started. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks to our three speakers from this session where we explored in a bit more depth some of the actions that are needed to tackle the climate crisis, act on nature and on people. As all of our speakers have highlighted, we won't achieve progress on any of these areas unless we think and act holistically across all three. The solutions exist, we just need to act on them. And tomorrow we will be shifting focus to explore these solutions and actions in more depth. So join us live broadcasting from Mansion House in London to hear from Mary Shapiro, Vice Chair of Bloomberg, former FCC Commissioner, and head of the GFAN Secretariat, to name just a few of her many roles to get the discussion going. We'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.